Hey, Jasmine. Hi. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm good. I know you're not alone. Who are you with? <laughs> I'm with my crazy dog, Roxy. Do you hear her bark or chomping on carrots? Oh. That's me trying quiet. <laughs> I love her. You have a vegan dog. Kind of, not really. So where are you, Jasmine? I am in Houston, Texas. Ah, what's that like? Is it nice and cool? <laughs> Um, right now it's like the surface of the sun and we're not even to summer really, you know, like real summer, it gets like unbearable. Yeah. But like good. I like to bake in the sun. <laughs> right. And, yeah. And everywhere you go has eight seats. So we're all right here. What's the hottest temperature you felt? Um, well, it's. It can get in the hundreds, but really what does it is like the humidity with the heat. There's humidity like in Texas? It's, yeah, it's really bad. It, it, it's just like a swamp almost. Yeah. Like when you go to New Orleans, it's like the air feels thick. It's kind of like that here, but not as intense. Okay, because in New York we get um, humidity. I always fantasize about going to the desert where it's like, you know, 130, but it's dry, so you don't feel it, so it's not like it matters. But oof, yeah. I didn't realize there was humidity over there. Um, I'm always frizzy, but it's good for your skin. It is. Mm -hmm. I'm 50. Anyway, you're an artist. What yeah. do you do? My God, I saw your stuff on Instagram and I was like, what's going on here? I love how people can make connections so quickly, like over social media. It's really amazing. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, so I do a little painting, um, some sculpture work, some installation recently with like digital components um, and a little bit of drawing. Cool. And I've been doing it lately, so You've been doing I don't know. I get excited by materials, so I'm just like, yeah, let's try it. You know, that's so funny because that's exactly what I saw when I looked into your work. I thought there's a certain excitement to the material here, like completely. I totally see that. And I never look up people when I interview them. I just want to meet them as I go. But for whatever reason, I had time right before I meet her and I'm like, let me look at her website. And you kind of blew me away because it said something about uh, ritual ornamentation. And I thought, wow, right. Can you tell me a you little know, bit about that? Yeah. So I'm not very, I like, one of my strengths is not writing about my work. You know, when you read sometimes what other people have written, it's like, dang, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> like, to be eloquent. But I think the process, my, like my work is very process based and um, there is an element of ritual in that because I use tweezers um, and I apply these really tiny rhinestones um, to the surface. So, I mean, there can be hundreds on like a portrait. I use them as like elements on the face, reflective elements. Um, How did that happen? So, How did you engage in, that, in such torture? <laughs> You know, I do really well with repetitive tasks and really meticulous tasks, so it just kind of happened. I like I had just moved back to Houston um, from the Midwest, Kansas City, Missouri, and I didn't have a job. I didn't know anybody yet, and I just was super productive. Um, and I just started experimenting, and you know, like you just kind of like fall into it or yeah. find your way there. So was that a positive move for you or was it something you were going through? Both. Because there's um, because there's certain solace in diving into a meditative practice like that, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, like I said, I, I really love like repetitive movements, meticulous work. Like I like knitting a lot. Yeah. And um, I don't do it so much here because it's hot and I can't really wear stuff like that. But <laughs> I lived in the Midwest. Um, I was always doing it, you know, like I like to keep my hands moving. Sorry, My spirit animal here is like walking around. I'm trying to distract her. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I, I really like the repetitive. So like taking the brush and dabbing some glue, taking the rhinestone and applying it with tweezers. So you just, there's a lot of focus and I feel like everything that I'm sort of experiencing around me and thinking like goes directly into a work, you know? Um, it's almost like when you're cooking that, like, um, that energy, it just, it becomes 
woven into the the visual aesthetic and the narrative of the work. Where does your mind go? Oh gosh, well, I'm often thinking about um, like where is this going? The colors, surface application. Um, I'm listening to a lot of music or podcasts. Yeah, like what? Stuff, but, um, well, it depends. Like behind me, I've got some like glittery stuff. I was listening to a lot of disco, like Sylvester. <laughs> um, oh, that's great. And then I think I, you can see some of the like graphic drawings. I was listening to a lot of like punk music, you know? So it became these like almost like photocopies of, of you know, that sort of aesthetic of like yeah. show posters, like yeah, flyers. Sure. Um, so it really just depends like what I'm, what I'm feeling at that point. That's amazing. I was speaking to an art, you know? Yeah. I was speaking to an artist today about, he was a stippler. <laughs> he stipples. And I thought, whoa, talk about That's meditation, okay. right? Like talk about needing space and time to kind of just create. Now, another reason I don't like to read people's bios or statements is because I, I can go off in tangents and here I go. You uh, mentioned Bernini and that you were inspired by one of his um, works. And okay. that's so, one of my favorite um, pieces of artwork in the world. Is it? Oh my God, yes. Have you seen it? Not in person. It's Who knows now? Tiny. It's tiny. And it's like next to an alley by a Starbucks. Like we went to Italy and we like went out of our way and we're like, no, it can't be here. It's like in a little shed. It was like literally not even sent, you know, pride. It wasn't place of pride. It was like adjacent. <laughs> I was like, whoa. So tell me about oh your God. experience. Yeah, it's weird. No, that's amazing. I love it. It's like when people go see the Mona Lisa and it's really tiny, you know? Um, that's really cool. I I have this connection to religious iconography iconography from a young age. Um, you have like a religious, <coughs> weird religious upbringing. Um as a kid. So I remember some of my earliest memories are being in the Catholic church and seeing the um, religious icons. And there's this like tension, you know, where it's like, like extreme joy and pleasure and then sorrow. And they're like fighting, you know, it's like, it's visually convoluted. Like you can't really tell what, which one or both, you know? Um, Gee, and, that's so indicative of the Latino diaspora and experience, isn't it? <laughs> Psyche, really. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like, the faith that we, like, the weight that those objects and images hold with us, you know, or, or people who respond to that. <laughs> Sorry. That's the cat that I was about earlier. Oh, no. Like, Get out of my face. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, like the religious eyes, like, are always watery, you know, these like tears. And again, it's like that sorrow um, and joy. So when I saw Bernini's sculpture, oh, hang on. Come here. Sorry. Are you mediating over there? Yes. Um, oh, this is the cat. Did you want to see him? Yes. Okay, so when I saw Bernini's sculpture, um, that's Otis. Whoa. Okay, Probably. guys, if you can hear this, I mean, if you can't see this because you're listening to this, it's what kind of, describe it. What kind of cat is this? Very. Um, he's just really splotchy with um, like all these tiny little spots and one on his chin and nose and this like really funny hairline, very, like a part, middle part. Very intense energy, actually. A little bit. I think he, he is like, like a little boy who's like, I'm going to cause trouble right now. You know, like... I, I can see that. Like when your mom is squatting at you, like, stop, behave. That's what my mom did. That's so jealous. Um, okay, so, Bernini. Um, I, like, when I learned about that early on, um, that it was, like, banned by the church, like, I loved it. Immediately, I was like, oh, show me more. Hang on one second. And um, I was really into that. Okay, putting the animals away. I like your couch. Oh, thanks. Okay, sorry. 
Wait, what part of the Latino diaspora are you from? Um, my parents are from Honduras, so they came here. My mother came here to the States when she was 13, and my father probably in his 18, like when he was 18, 19. Mm. Are they more Americanized than uh, Hondureños? Um, so that's pretty young, no? Yeah. So my father passed away when I was a baby, so mm. I can answer that. My mother was very into assimilating. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, is like a big part of how I grew up. Uh, like, I don't speak Spanish very well. It's something that I really practice. Um, I was telling you earlier that I speak sort of Spanglish. But I really try, you know, and um, I, I luckily here in Texas, I get to practice every day and speak it and um, I don't know, get better at it. But that's like a lifelong thing, you know? Yeah. But I feel... Um, is there a shame to that in Texas? Like not speaking or is it more normal there to not speak Spanish? Now, I feel like when I was younger, it was something that was other. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, um, I'm bouncing around here. My mother moved us to this like upper middle class white neighborhood where I was one of the like few brown kids. I think there were like three <laughs> my class at the time, you know, like not many. And now it's just so different. Um, and I think that's just like how you, those experiences from your youth directly impact you when you're older right so I mean now I I remember not not really feeling connected and sort of being other like between two worlds between this like Americanized world and like from my roots right of, and neither quite un fitting or understanding so it's like I like Americanized things and Americanized culture but I'm also like about this life as well you know um, and then neither one being understood by the other like my mother not understanding why I like like weird music or wanted to wear like certain clothes you know so I don't know I think now I'm sort of thinking like maybe that's this weird tension that's that keeps going like something that interests me absolutely yeah so, just like, like you were talking about the Bernini the face right just made that connection there you go see I, you're like my therapist I need to like, oh, this is you're, I'm sending you the bill right after so relax Okay. But so I'm wondering, in speaking about Bernini and speaking about the Latino heritage, was your first experience with art um, with religious iconography? For sure, hundred mm. um, percent. Like we respond to images, right, and colors, and colors. For me, it was um, those images from the church of like weeping women, right? Before I knew it was like Mary and Jesus weeping and um, that those images were made to specifically look a certain way. Like, okay, she's supposed to be sorrowful or weeping or young and fragile. And then after that, I think Egyptian um, artwork, you know, like hieroglyphics, those, those two dimensional images that sort of represent something that's three dimensional. They're like eyes or um, symbols that, that they imply more, you know, but it's so hard to make something that's so simplified and clean. And I think that's something that really made a big impact on me when I was little. Um, I just always responded to the images and um, like PBS, right? So people <laughs> like my, my childhood heroes, like Jacques Cousteau and Julia Child and Bob Ross. And um, there was a guy here named Commander Mark who was some white dude with a curly mullet who would, like, draw on TV and just made it so cool, you know? How fun. Like, just it's responded to makers. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. I grew up on PBS, too. My my hero yeah. was LeVar Burton. <laughs> yes! Reading Thank Rainbow. You. And all those horrible, well, not horrible, but very honest documentaries about American life and... It made me want to move to Paris as soon as I was 19, but I came to New York instead, uh, which is fine. Uh, but yeah, that's really funny. Um, how did you arrive at your uh, visual language? Um, I think that it's something that's ongoing and it's always kind of changing. So 
I would say I was really productive in my youth, um, like constantly practicing, drawing, painting. Um, and then as I got older, I went to art school. And I think art school was just a period of confusion for me. Mm-hmm. And long after I graduated, it took a long time to get out of that. How so? so I, um, I just felt like it was a very archaic institution mm-hmm. um, focused on like white straight males, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and that just, that was my experience. I don't, I don't know how it is for others. It seems like others had really good mm-hmm. positive experiences, but I, I just didn't, I didn't. I hated art school. I hated art school. Oh my God. It's just such a waste of time, but I needed that piece of paper for validation. And that's exactly what it was. And ever since then, I've been very careful about where I get my validation from, you know? Yeah. I, I, I try to take away the positive from my experiences, right? And not like dwell or focus. It's like, okay, well, that's how it was. And so what do I take away from that? So for me, it was like, man, I learned so much about like work ethic and it was a time that I'll probably never have again, like working side by side with my peers, those whose work I really respected, you know, and I learned so much from them. So, and they're still practicing and they're in New York, um, most of them. So like, those are the things that really impacted me. But after art school, I really focused on sort of um, like craft, like, Mm printmaking, knitting, sewing, fibers, weaving, like textiles, a lot of that, because I was doing art programming for youth and teens. And so I feel like I was still creative, but in a less like, this is a picture that I'm drawing type of thing, you know, more like focusing on process and um, craft really, which is very like craft based. Did that feel less, uh, less of a value in, in the system that you were taught? I mean, that's a loaded question. Because, I mean, yeah, I hear what you're saying because I remember I was doing a lot of embroidery when I was in art school and beading, um, and I was in the painting department. So there was a lot of conversation of like, well, is that art or is that craft? Like, it's not, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's just a different language, or or similar, but you know, it it does have value, and I think people are really changing and have since changed. You oh, know, yeah. Jenny no, Hart totally. was an Austin based embroiderer is, I think she's in LA now, but um, someone that I was like, wow, she's really making these giant embroideries. Um, and who was it? Gata Amir who did these like really giant erotic embroideries that they <laughs> almost read like wallpaper. Um, those are things that really influenced me when I was, you know, in my early twenties in art school, like trying to figure out what I was doing. But I think once I moved here to Houston and I just became really productive, um, it allowed me this time and focus to experiment. And so I just started um, doing these portraits and first they were really simplified. I was thinking of masks. So I started doing these like floral patterns um, and like repetitive tiny little flowers that I would just paint over and over and over again. And they sort of made this, um, like a face and then they became masks. And then I started embellishing the mask. And then I started painting these like eyes behind the mask. And then I started adding colored skin. So when I was saying earlier about our experiences from our youth sort of impacting us and how we see things, well, when I was growing up, I didn't really see like brown Barbies or, you know, even just like in my neighborhood, I was like others. So that became something that was very important to me um, to paint like beautiful brown skin tones, like wide arrays, you know, of, like browns, tans, blacks. Um, and that's something that really like gives me satisfaction when I'm working, especially the eyes. Um, they've just been progressively getting more red and pink and watery, you know, um, and stylized, I think. So the, the aesthetic of my work and, and the style that I sort of am vibing with at the time, I think it's like, I have a look, you know, I guess like what comes out, I'm, I'm 
and feeling it, but it, it's also kind of evolving. That's amazing. Who do you think is your audience? Who do you think are the people that gravitate towards your work? Other than random podcasters that are I like, don't hey, know. <laughs> talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Um, gosh, I don't know. No one's ever asked me that. I, I don't know. Maybe people who like Swarovski. No, I'm just kidding. I use a lot of Swarovski. Crystals. Super, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. People who like bright colors, lots of patterns, but specifically, I don't, other artists, maybe women, artists of color. I don't know. Yeah. Personally, I, I think, and I didn't even think about it until I read your ritualistic embellishment and you talking about religion, but there was something very, and I love this word and I use it way too much, and it's like a $5 oh. word, but there's something Later. very cathartic about it like there's a gaze you know and there's a confrontation that's not you know it, it it reads as a female gaze but it's not at all sexual at least i didn't read it as sexual or or maternal you know which is what you would expect from a mother gaze it, there's something very slightly confrontational in a very uh non-aggressive way i want to say i don't know they can be yeah a lot of times i find that i paint female figures and they're looking to the side you know like to the right um and then sometimes they're looking directly at you but i think that there are different levels of intimacy and eye contact is so intimate yeah you know sometimes even if you don't know someone and you're just like staring like it gets uncomfortable yeah well but, now it's all about eye contact with these damn masks right <laughs> you have to look at each other I know. Are people wearing masks where you are? Real. <gasps> yes and no, not enough. Oof, We're in Texas. And it, like, they're coming out with these articles about how it's becoming this, like, hot spot. Okay, so we're in Texas, right? It's, like, conservative, Republican. Um, sorry not to get into, like, political What are you doing parts. there? No, we have to. <laughs> I know. Well, it, it's just crazy because... They've opened things up, I, I feel like, too quickly. And a lot of people, like, bars are open at 50%. It just, I don't know. It's it's a strange <laughs> time. That they, Was that your dog choking? No, that was her barking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I had to, like, run over and give her the little baby puppy high mark. I keep realizing <laughs> I'm like, holding a carrot in my hand and just, like, <laughs> being super animated with my hand with a baby carrot. This is to keep her from barking. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my God. Yeah. Can you drink alcohol in the streets there now? Because in New York, it's like Las Vegas all of a sudden. You can literally walk around with a cocktail. I don't think so. I want to be like, it's like disgusting. to go bars in New Orleans. That's, that's yeah, nice. it's it's like that, right? But Yeah. I don't, I don't think we're there yet. Scarier. Yeah, right. I don't but know. Maybe we're on our way. <sighs> so we're on our way to something. I don't know. Anyway, um, so this disconnect between you being this productive teenager and then going to college and then being kind of reprogrammed in a weird way, what trait kept you going and allowed you to arrive at that formalized or more nourished artist that you came out on the other side? Like, how did I just not stop? Yeah, like, what, what in With you... With the struggle? Yeah, because I think... Fight right, struggle? Yeah, I think right now a lot of people are, like, going through the motions because we have to, and we have to find that one thing that'll kind of take us to the other side, right? And, and be able to, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still making art that excites me, that I deem valuable. What mm -hmm. trait in you was it your audience was it your 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 message your mission i don't know no, i mean i don't think of when i'm thinking of myself it's more raw it's like there's something inside of me and i feel like other creatives that like you have to do it mm -hmm. you it's like an not an itch but it's something inside like a need that needs to be satisfied to to you need to fulfill that right so I found other ways of doing it, like knitting or embroidering, you know, um, and not thinking of it as like I'm making a piece of art. Like I'm going to sit down and I'm going to make art. If I put too much pressure on it, you know, like too much thought, it's, it's like it's not 
fun or natural, at least for me. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's it, right? Isn't the expectation of having to make art opposed to just much. going on that process yeah. and journey? I think for me, it's the experience of sitting down at my desk or um, even painting on the floor uh, and connecting with the materials. That's the best. Like when you're sitting and you just lose track of time and you're you're just so into the materials and the process. And for me, it's like that satisfaction of paint or mixing paint and laying it down and or laying like a clean edge with a paintbrush. It just gives me this, I don't know, oneness with it, you yeah. know, and that mental state of, of just really in the zone. And it's not always like that. Sometimes I'm like, oh, this is shit. What am I doing? And then I just, I take a lot of breaks. I cuddle with my crazy animals or like have yeah. a coffee and then I come back, you know? And you come back. Yeah. Isn't that the most important part? You come back. I come back. Yeah. But I mean, man, right before quarantine, I had so many deadlines, like back to back to back to back. And I was kind of burnt out. And then as quarantine started, like I finished the last one and I had like a few weeks of just like calm, <laughs> you know? So it's sort of like recollecting. Um, and then it sort of clears your mind to, okay, I'm ready. So I, you know, I, I have some other projects that I'm working on now. And so it makes me feel like, okay, I'm like reconnecting because this weekend I was painting and I was so productive. It just feels good. It feels really good. That's Maybe that's what, what that's what does it. That's what brings me back is that it feels good. When it's good, it feels good. That's that's so simple. It just feels good. Yeah, I love that. It feels good. Yeah. I love that. Now, again, I don't like reading people's bios because then I'm all like, so tell me. Um, so <laughs> tell me. <laughs> tell me about your uh, magazine cover. Mm, which one? Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> new paint. Does that sound bad? No, that's new no. painting. Yes, that one. Um, surreal. I'm still like, wow, I can't believe that happened. So tell us. I, I can't. I know nothing about it. I just read it and then I'm like, oh, I can't look at this because then I'm gonna have to like do research, and I hate research. Um, so you tell me everything I need to know. <laughs> well, let's see. I when I was in art school, it was a magazine that I just looked at. Like, wow. There are there are real artists. These it's like legit, you know. And never in my life did I think I would ever be in it. Like it just it it was other, you know. More of like, well, that'll never be me. But it didn't even occur to me to think that it could be a possibility um, for that. Sorry, that's the cat that she's barking at. So it, it never occurred to me that that was even a possibility. How did you get right? there? It was when I moved back to Houston and I was super productive. Um, I just started listening to a lot of the Jackson 5 and painting. And when I found out that I was going to be on the cover, they asked me for an image, a high-res image, right? Well, Hurricane Harvey was happening here and I was literally trapped in my house. I couldn't leave to go... Um, I go to this computer lab at the photography center here to like scan and use their equipment. And so a friend that was in New York, like helped me, Drew Bolton, he's a photographer out there. He was like helping me do it from afar. So it was, I was so grateful that he helped me and he's super talented. Um, but like, that's what I think about. I think about, wow, like Hurricane Harvey, this natural disaster that impacted everybody here. Um, but it's surreal. And, and, how, it, and how did they find you? Did you submit or did they? I submitted. So I, I found myself with a stack of work and it was just piling up and sitting there. And so I thought, okay, I made a goal for myself. That's a big one. I made a goal to be more ambitious with my work. Um, and so I was like, I'm just going to apply to everything. And I had all this time, right? It was still like job hunting and I didn't really know anybody reconnecting with my city. And I just started applying and man, lots and lots and lots of rejection. And you learn over time that it doesn't, it's not a reflection of your work or, 
you know, like it, it is what it is. Like, don't take it to heart. So I developed a thin skin and just kept like applying. And then I got in and it was just insane. Still, even now, I keep saying that, but it is surreal. And I'm what year was really that? grateful. Um, I think it's been two years now. And how has it impacted your career on a, on a scale, a greater scale? Um, I have had people reach out after having seen my work. But I think for me, the biggest impact was just that it was this validation or like, um, okay, like keep, keep doing what you're doing. Keep, keep aspiring or keep, keep wanting more, keep pushing forward, keep making work, you know, like it was, it was, I don't know. I, everything that's popping in my head sounds so cheesy. Like, no, no, no. like well, don't, don't be so hard on yourself, but. I think it's important, you know, especially for artists who are on that cusp of like, okay, what do I do, right? Like, how do I get there? And I think sometimes we imagine, oh, something like this, you're set. You don't have to work ever again. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, you're part of the, it's part of the process. These are the valid, these are like, you know, the little coins in, in Mario Brothers that you collect along the way, you know? Yeah. There, there is no end. There's always more to do and more to, to see. Um but I think, like you said, it's, a, it's, a, it's not even validation, it's proof, right? It's proof that it's the pudding. It's proof that you have something to say and, and that you're, you're aiming and hitting as I much. Think I, you know, I, like who is hardest on themselves? Like we are, right? And so like it felt really good, but I think for me it was like a lesson, like, okay, I have this ambition to like, to make work and um just kind of put it out there (laughs) (laughs) more baby carrots um i think for me it was just like okay like keep keep those goals coming you know like for me it was like validation okay well this was a goal like cross it off what's next what are we doing keep it moving forward you know and I saw that you were also on a huge billboard. So that was the Main Street Marquee. So it's funny because those two things happened at the same time. Um, the New American Paintings cover and the Main Street Marquee, which was through a Wine Garden Art Group here. But they Houston. were not connected. They were not connected. So it was part of your um, whole momentum of like really just submitting. I was applying, sub- applying, wow, applying. applying. Yeah, submitting. submitting. Um, Although it, it, in, in Spanish there's... Applying, aplicate, literally means to kind of activate yourself, to like plug yourself in, which is really interesting. Te aplicaste. So you, you got very plugged in. I love it. Which is so key. I love how the translations are almost nicer. Oh, well. English, you, know? Like, you, you know how to say wife? <laughs> That's my favorite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Handcuff. <laughs> I'm going to be doing the Spanish group translate. Oh, I was thinking of like ganas, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Desire, like, this discumption or fire in the belly, right? Um, yeah, I think so. So for me, the mainstream marquee was this, again, surreal, but like that one felt really good because I could it and I worked downtown and I would like walk there sometimes because it was like on my way and it was tangible you know like physically I was like there with it and experiencing it and actually I think for me that was that was bigger because I connected with so many people and I met so many people and in what capacity like people walking down the street or people reaching out to you people who found me or would tag me on Instagram, like walking by um, people that I met through it who like found me because they had seen it or recognized my work later, uh, maybe at a show or something, you know, and then the work kind of had similar look, you know, they could recognize the work and then started talking to me from that. But even people from overseas that, that found me through that and, like the friendships that I've made from that, I think 
it's surreal and it's beautiful it's really yeah. cool i mean there's something also very democratic about it right it's a billboard people in the streets people don't have to be initiated to like paintings to stumble into a cover right it's like i'm walking down the street and there you are um congratulations that's, that, that's really beautiful thank you yeah i mean the connection is that everyday people it, it doesn't have to be like oh that's art right we are surrounded by images and colors and advertisements every day and people put thought into those like like a painting or you know it's a different media um, and so there was so much joy watching people interact with it or like the, the train was there, the light rail was right there. So there was just so much foot traffic and people being able to connect with it without having to be like in a gallery or a museum or searching for stuff online. It's, it's an image out in the open, like a mural, you know? I love, I love that. I like love making that. it accessible to people. Yeah. And Can it you... doesn't have to be like highbrow or this is what I was thinking about. It's, it's an image and they then react to it if they want, you know? Like you're not there to describe your work or support your work. So whatever their impressions are, like that's what it is, you know? And I also really like that. Like the work has to speak for itself. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you spoke about giving yourself that prompt to be more ambitious. What are some of the things on your list that are part of your ambitious plan? Because I think um, it, takes, it takes a lot of guts, right? To first to admit that you're ambitious, especially for a person of color, a Latina, a woman. For some reason, you know, it, actually, going back to Spanish, um, <laughs> It's, it has a very negative connotation in Spanish. In English, it's like, yay, you're ambitious, good for you. But in Spanish, it's like a, like, it almost sounds like a... Like arrogant or... No, it's actually a, a, a fault, kind of like a, a, a really bad habit or something. It, it, it's, it's a very bizarre ambition. Um, but yeah, how, how did... What, what's on your radar? Um, I think for me, it... How do I say it? It's a continuation of submitting. It's a continuation of, like, these are ongoing goals to keep making and being productive. Um, I've started experimenting with some different work that I hadn't tried before, like video projections on in installation form. Cool. And so that's something new for me. Murals are new for me. So I think for me, like, essentially the goal is growth and to not be afraid of materials or new projects, endeavors, and like, diving in. I think this is a strange time because we're, we're finding ourselves having to reevaluate re and rethink how we do things, right? Like galleries, most of them aren't closed or they're by appointment only. Um, and so that makes viewing work and interacting with the public in that way challenging. Like, I have a solo show that opened up right as everything started closing down, right? So I killed myself over this body of work, and it's like, oh, nobody's going to see it, you know? Or I also have some other stuff, uh, an installation up right now, and the same thing. So I'm not alone. Like, all these artists all over have yeah. been working and working and working, right? And so I think that I take comfort in knowing that, okay, we're in this together, and really like it brings the power to like the visual image through like social media and our connections and like you found me you know like we found each other yeah. and i think that that's that's amazing that we're not limited just to this like physical capacity and this physical capacity to go into a space it's nice but okay where do we go from here so where do we go from here? What, what, what do you think will be the biggest thing that changes in your practice moving forward? Um, I really would like to try, like, more... Well, I have, like, my own... Like, okay, I really want to try ceramics again. I feel like when I was working with clay, it was right before I moved here, and it, something clicked, mm. and it felt good. Um, 
Is I want to try that, and I want to try like uh, I want I want to try like projections, more like video projections, and seeing how that that works like onto materials. Like right now, I'm projecting onto silver fringe, like tinsel. Um, that sounds magical. I'm rambling. Is I'm it? Rambling. No, I love. That's why I'm here. Ramble away. <laughs> Yeah. Does that look right. cool? How, that sounds amazing. Um, yeah, so my work, the solo show that's up right now, I did a really big video. Um, there are three projectors with paintings that I projected onto silver fringe. I made a fringe enclosure. So I have stuff up at Project Row Houses here in Houston as well, and I made a smaller fringe box that was really dense and projected another painting onto it. So for me, it was bringing the viewer into this like it's sort of like interacting with the work in a different way you become part of the work and funny enough I was doing an artist talk and I happened to walk in front of the screen and it was a painting of the flowers and it was projected on me and I was just in my work in a different way that oh, I hadn't cool. been before yeah and I'm getting chills kind of talking about it because it was just such a like an experience for me right um so I think I want to experience that but or or make that available to others but that'd be so again, important we're, we're in this weird like we're in strange times we're in strange so. times and yeah i think it's so important to show up and, and it sounds like that's a really amazing way to show up in your own work like physically show up and put your face in your work in your body right um yeah. the work of anna mendita came to mind are you familiar with her work of her yeah, it, yeah. It, that flashed when you were saying that yeah um that's really important. and you're you're right she was in the work in lots of different ways um Fun. yeah i just read this book about her no way from the 70s yeah during quarantine um where is it it's on my bookshelf here naked by the window oh wow what was your takeaway it was interesting. Um, there were things that I didn't know about her. I think I learned more about her and her early life. When I was in art school, I went to go see the show of hers. I think it was in Iowa. And I had this like connection with her work. That was my first introduction with it, right? Like another brown Latina artist. And I was like, oh my God, like someone else, you know? Like yeah, I, I felt connected. I saw myself in her um but yeah the book was good hmm. i've been reading a lot during oh man lucky you i'm watching too many like netflix and eating and cooking nice oh, you're, keeping yourselves busy cleaning <laughs> you're living the life it sounds working from home too what are you in education still no. So about a year and a half ago, I switched to corporate America. So that's the other thing I know. Um, Good for you. So I, we got to infiltrate. Really? Well, we got to infiltrate. It's, it, this is my thing. You know, yes, they have all the power and yes, they're going to destroy the world. But the only way to counterbalance that is to have be on the inside so you know what's happening and you can tell others and you can hold the door for other people. Uh, because it's going to happen either way. And that gives you money you know, to buy other people's art. <laughs> it It is strange, and I swore to myself that I would never do it, because I was a librarian after art school. Like, I was working with books, and I was doing art programming for youth and teens, right? Oh, my God, that's so and families. cool. But it also, because I grew up in that, I came from a single mother, and we use libraries for everything, literally so many resources. And libraries have changed over time to become these like really prolific community centers wow. and advocates for the community, right? So it's not just about books, it's about like helping people with immigration status, you know, like paperwork and applying for jobs and helping with homework and giving people a, a place to come and and learn or give them opportunities, you know? So I felt very connected with that and I was so passionate about it. And then about a year and a half ago, I, I think I did that for 10 years. Wow. It, it, it's almost like social work in it, a way. No, it absolutely is. It, it, it kind of takes its toll on you. So I was ready for a change. 
and I found myself in this position and it's super challenging. Um, but I also get to travel, which is pretty cool. Um, so are you a corporate librarian? No, that would have been cool. <laughs> no, not as cool as you would think. It, it's stuffy. Because at first I thought that. I wanted to work in art libraries. I, but I, before I moved from Kansas City, Missouri, I was working in the special collections. And that was like a dream. Like old books, old magazines, wow. research. I loved that. Yeah. But, you know, like, we can't be stagnant. Or I don't want to be stagnant. Like, I want to okay. keep growing and, and experiencing. So this is where I am now. And it's good. It's challenging. It is different. And I think that is another reason why I am like, or try to be productive because there's this like one side of my life that is like very conservative. I'm not conservative, but like the work, right. And the establishment. So I feel like that energy like has to go somewhere. Well, well, there's Bernini again, isn't it? There's that tension that we were talking about earlier. Can you, can I lay on your couch? Can we do this? I'm telling you, yeah. Like uh, once a week for an hour. <laughs> I am a coach, but about that later. But I'm also a cheerleader. No, but isn't that, isn't that funny? That duality that, that does create balance. You know, that's amazing. I didn't think about it in that sense, but... Yeah, I and you probably have health insurance, which you probably did before. But I mean, it still puts you in the minority of the it's world. It's challenging. It's challenging, and I feel like okay, I'm I'm experiencing different things, or or trying to see if this fits. Yeah, and and going with with that. But listen, it sounds like know, it sounds like you job, have, yeah. It, if we support ourselves and that allows us to to sort of seek creative endeavors comfortably or or how do I say that that I think a lot of artists have jobs to support themselves so that they can like sustain their practice that's what I'm trying to say all artists have jobs to sustain their practice. I mean, I'm a therapist. No, I'm not a therapist. But, you know, yeah. You're going to be my therapist. You are hired forever for eternity. Hello. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have my pen ready to take notes. But, yeah, no, it's insane. I am so excited to hear what you're going to do next. And um, I won't take any more of your precious time with your dogs because I know they want your attention. Um, They've eaten so many baby carrots. <laughs> But I think I just heard her say, I'm sorry I was barking so much. <laughs> I really hate you for these damn carrots. No, um, <laughs> thank you for connecting with me. I'm so excited to, to connect with you and listen to how good it is. Like, really, you know? I think, that, Ooh, that, I think that's amazing. Um, and we'll be in touch. I'll be rooting for you here all the way in Brooklyn. Okay, so I'll contact you with my next therapy appointment. Let's do it. <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much. One, two, three. Okay, that was it. So that was the conversation. How did it feel? It felt good. It felt very natural.